Crash of the Titans got a lukewarm reception when it was released. It wasn't hated at all, but it wasn't what Crash fans wanted for the series, and it only brought in a limited number of new fans. Just like with Spyro, Sierra Entertainment were determined not to give up on Crash until it was either successful or completely ran into the ground. So only a year after Crash of the Titans we got a sequel, Crash Mind Over Mutant. As the game was released in 2008 and it was the last main game in the Crash series, you can probably tell that it wasn't a success. But what can you really expect when the game was made by Radical Entertainment, who you may know as the people behind The Simpsons Hit and Run? But sadly, they also made Mario is Missing on the NES. I find games like this interesting though, as Crash Mind Over Mutant was either ignored or hated by people, but it was also a 3D platformer released on the Xbox 360 and features one of the most beloved gaming icons. It's why you're seeing a review of this game over something like Crash 2 or 3. While Crash 2 and 3 were awesome games, everybody already knows that. Crash Mind Over Mutant was made by the wrong developer, was released in the wrong era of gaming, and helped remove Crash from the mainstream. So, let's have a look at the game itself, as with its reputation, it clearly has a lot to live up to. Crash Mind Over Mutant takes place a year after the events of Crash of the Titans, which means that all the redesigns from the first game are present here, as well as the mutants. Dr. Cortex has teamed up with Dr. Embryo to create a device called NV, which is a headset that turns creatures into mutants as well as controlling their mind. After Coco and Crunch are taken over by the MVs, Crash and Aku Aku head out to stop Cortex and save the island. The story is messy, but let's start out with the positives. The main cutscenes in the game all focus on parodying famous cartoon styles. This ranges from something like hand puppets to directly parodying shows like South Park and Dragon Ball Z. They all look great, each one being distinct but also being well animated and colourful. In terms of the writing, the jokes in the games are okay, nothing hilarious but you may find yourself laughing at times. The story is very all over the place. The overall plot is about stopping Cortex, but a lot of times you're just meeting up with random characters from the Crash universe and then watching a parody without anything really properly tying it together. It's not a big deal as this is a platformer, but it takes away from the possible tension and excitement that is experienced towards the final moments of a game. For example, in Super Mario 64 when you're at the end, you know what, I reference that game far too much. There must be another example I can think of. So, in Banjo-Kazooie, there's not much story in the game, but the goal is clear. You're travelling through Grunty's castle to stop her and rescue your sister. This means that when you beat all the different challenges and collect enough jiggies to reach to the top of the castle, there's a real tension in the last few moments of the game, as you're finally going to reach your goal that you put so much into. Same with Crash 2. Actually, Crash 2 would have been a better example before. Oh well. So in Crash 2, you have a lot of communication with different characters throughout the game, and while you start out by helping Cortex to collect crystals, once you manage to play through the point and beat enough of the game where it's revealed that Cortex is evil, there's an excitement to playing the last few levels with this new but predictable knowledge. In Crash Mind Over Mutant, there's the goal of stopping Cortex, but because all you're doing is meeting up with random characters, there's a bit of a detachment. When you reach the last level, it doesn't feel like everything has been building up to the moment where you finally face Cortex, he's just the next parody to watch. I know this may be weird for me to criticise the story structure in a Crash game, but there's a subtle art to investing the player in a platformer, and Mind Over Mutant misses the mark. Crash Mind Over Mutant continues the gameplay established in the first game. You take control of Crash as you jump on different platforms, fight enemies and take control of the mutants. The mechanic that separates these two games from the rest of the Crash series is that there are multiple mutants scattered in levels that can be controlled. There have been a number of improvements to the mutant system in Mind Over Mutant. First of all, the mutants can be stored, so if you're controlling a mutant, you come across a platforming section that would be easy to do while playing as just Crash, you can press a button and store the mutant for later. Storing and taking your mutant out again is very quick, so switching mutants doesn't interrupt the pacing, and it can also be very useful during the combat. I never found myself growing any sort of attachment to a particular stored mutant, but it is a helpful feature which eliminates a problem that Crush of the Titans had, where you would have to recapture the same mutant over and over again because the game would force you to abandon certain mutants for platforming. This brings me to the second improvement, which is that Mutants King L jump. The majority of Mutants King L be used to get across platforms, and certain mutants now have powers that are necessary to get past certain obstacles. For example, there's a mutant called Grimly that can slow down time. This power is useful in combat as it gives enemies less time to react, but it is also needed to get over fans that spin too fast. 
These new changes mean that the mutants feel much better integrated within the gameplay, and using them is more natural. There are other gameplay problems that still stop the Mutant series from being anything great, but the changes made here are definitely a step in the right direction. The combat system remains largely the same, with a few tweaks. You now have a larger range of moves, but not by much. But every mutant can now jump in the air and slam down on enemies. When fighting has crashed, the counter attack is now easier to pull off, as a button prompt now appears on screen so you don't get hit as cheaply. I still didn't enjoy the combat though, as performing moves still has a delay, making everything feel awkward and you still have to fight a large amount of enemies at once. However, with the mutants now being more versatile, the game's focus is no longer on the combat. Unlike the first game, you're rarely forced to properly fight enemies, and you can just spend most of your time platforming instead. While I don't like the combat, it doesn't bring down the game in the same way as Crash of the Titans, because it's a much smaller part of this game. You can still level up Crash by collecting Mojo, the orbs found in levels, but you can also level up individual mutants now. Upgrading yourself and your mutants is such a small part of this game though that I never found myself going out of my way to collect Mojo, so it doesn't really add much. Instead of playing levels in a linear fashion, Mind Over Mutant adopts a more open world design. You start out on Wumpa Island, which is the centre of the game. You unlock different areas as you go, such as a snow location called Ratical Kingdom, but each new mission you unlock could take place in any of the areas you have. Incorporating an open world was a good idea, but the execution is poor. So, at the beginning of the game you're exploring Wumpa Island. Eventually you unlock the Ratical Kingdom, so travel over there and unlock a new mutant. You then have to travel back to Wumpa Island with the new mutant to meet up with Engine. After beating him, you then have to go back to the Rastical Kingdom where you eventually unlock a different mutant. So, once again, you have to go back through Wumpa Island to access a new area that has been unlocked. The game forces you to play the same sections over and over again. Certain levels will loop you back to where you need to be, but there's no shortcuts for the sections that link the different areas. The levels you have to replay multiple times aren't too bad or that long, but they're not fun because you have to play them so many times. The reason you make your game more open world is to make that feeling that you're exploring a real place, but this game doesn't achieve that feeling. Just like in the first game, you have no camera control, and the levels are still linear in their design, they're just now all connected. This means that you don't feel like you're really exploring a place, because there's not much to see and you can't properly investigate levels. The mission objective will also normally be reach a certain destination, so the game never encourages you to look around the world. This game might as well have been set levels that you play one after the other, as all the open world adds is backtracking and not much else. The game being open world introduces other issues, one of them being related to the problem that I spoke earlier, how the game has no proper build up to the final boss. With the game's structure, there's no final area that you reach at the end of the game. The whole time you're jumping all over the map, and then there's a part where you fight three bosses, and then the final level just unlocks. In games like Son of the Hedgehog and Donkey Kong Country, the world themes changes have some level of consistency as you get closer to the end. In both games you start off in a more tropical, natural environment, and the more you progress the more industrial everything became. Not every level was consistent with this idea, but overall it made playing the game feel like some sort of journey. Crash of the Titans does something similar, where you start off on Wumpa Island and then travel through many different locations until you reach the last few levels that take place in more human structures. A game doesn't need to do something like this with its levels themes, but in Mind Over Mutant when you're just jumping between the same four themes over and over, it would have been nice to stick with that idea used in the other games. Only having four themes also make the games feel shorter than Crash of the Titans, although it's about the same length. Crash Mind Over Mutant is definitely an improvement over Crash of the Titans. There are plenty of refinements across the board that help the game feel more enjoyable and less annoying. A lot of effort went into the different animation styles of the cutscenes, combat is no longer the focus, and changes were made to make the Mutants a better gameplay mechanic. This game still isn't anything great though. It has the biggest problem that the first game had, which is that it feels uninspired. Everything in this game has been done before and done better, and it doesn't feel like it was made by people who had a real vision for what they wanted to do with the Crash franchise. Let's take a quick look at the covers of the two games. Both games have the exact same art style, but the covers art styles are different for some reason. You could also just swap the two titles of the games and the covers would still make sense, which I think says it all. 
My score is 6.0 out of 10. This is definitely a step forward, just only a small one, in a series that we will likely never see again.